Each week we've had the pleasure of interviewing, interviewing people who are significant to our community, um, and you are one as well, uh, in, 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 through your teaching and your involvement in, uh, in different areas through the Jewish community. But certainly the one that I hope, was hoping that we can spend the most significant amount of time discussing is your work with Jews for Judaism. And as we know that Jews for Judaism certainly has, if not its central point, um, a lot of what it does is it deals with the Hebrew Christian missionaries. And I know over the years, we've had, I've had the pleasure of being an acquaintance and a friend um, and having interacted with you many times, even if you remember the time that we had the Jews for Judaism over at the plaza at Steeles and Bathurst, and we protested outside for a couple of weeks. Um, and they gave, they ended up giving Jews for Judaism an office right next door. <laughs> There's nothing like living next door to your enemies. So the, uh, we've had really the opportunity for quite a while to get to know each other. And I've been able to see some of your work with Jews for Judaism. Um, I was wondering if you could just give us a bit of, um, of, of an idea of what Jews for Judaism does on a whole, and then what you might do as well outside of that. There's a little bit of a history of Jews for Judaism because um, over the years, it has undergone some uh, transformation and development in ways that we didn't originally uh, envision. Um, the organization goes back to the really the early 1980s, mid 80s, and it started in two different cities uh, simultaneously, unaware of e unawares of each other. Um, it was started in Los Angeles. And in Baltimore, Mutti Berger, who now works with Asha Torah, started it in Baltimore. And the Los Angeles and Baltimore offices did not know about each other. They operated independently with the same name. And then when they found out that they were both doing the same thing with the same name, they joined forces. And all the way back then, in the, in the early days of what we were doing, um, it really had a single focus, meaning that the Jewish community... Um, since the late 60s, early 70s, had been subjected to, as everyone probably in the room knows, um, pretty aggressive um, proselytizing efforts by Hebrew Christian groups like Jews for Jesus. Um, and it took the whole Jewish community by surprise. Um, we weren't used to that. We were used to people coming with crosses and presenting themselves as Christians and trying to convert us. And that's been an old story. But we didn't have any experience dealing with people coming to us with uh, a Jewish uh, face, meaning claiming to be Jews, claiming to practice Judaism, uh, often wearing a kippah, sometimes wearing tzitzit, um, you know, telling us that they go to synagogue and that they observe the, the Torah, um, it just it was strange for the Jewish world to encounter this kind of um, of experience. We, it, it totally took the Jewish world by surprise. And because of that, we actually um, we helped them, meaning that in the very early days, uh, what happened was the Jewish community in, uh, really just went ballistic. And we became very aggressive as a community. Um, you know, there was just fighting them and, you know, painting them in, in the worst terms imaginable and, you know, calling them names. And uh, every rabbi in, this, in North America would speak about them. And we, so we gave them a tremendous amount of, of attention and of publicity. And the other problem was that because the, the general tendency was to paint them all as evil and wicked and deceptive and nasty and, you know, like almost monsters, when, you know, typical Jewish people met them, they, they said, well, these people seem very nice. And so in, in, in several ways, we really facilitated their successes, both in terms of um, you know, making sure that every Jew on the planet knew about them. It's quite amazing when you think about it, that if, if you're starting up a company and, you know, you have name recognition among 100% of the population, because I've asked Jewish people all across the world this question, 
How many of you have heard of Jews for Jesus? Every breathing Jew on the planet has heard of them. And that's quite an astounding success, uh, you know, in terms of their ability to, uh, you know, get their name out and their, their, uh, you know, their message out. Because that was the genius of uh, the movement, of their movement, was to call it Jews for Jesus. Um, the reason they did that and the reason that they, they took a very in-your-face kind of approach where they would go out on the street and they would buttonhole people and give out literature, they were very visible and they, they wanted it like that. They wanted to provoke a reaction, but they also wanted this name to get out. They wanted Jews to know there's an organization called Jews for Jesus. Why was that so important to them? Because for the typical Jewish person, um, there has always been this assumption that Christianity and Jesus are not on the menu for us. You know, if you speak to Jewish people that have converted to Christianity over the past 50, 60 years, you know, they'll all tell you that it was very hard. One of the reasons that it was so hard is that they were the only Jew they knew who came to believe in Jesus. They felt so lonely. They felt so isolated. And, you know, there, there was this sort of implicit assumption that Jews don't believe in Jesus. That's just the, the, the conventional wisdom. You know, you don't have to know anything. You don't have to know a word of the Bible. You don't have to know any history. It just was, this was the conventional wisdom among all Jews. Jews don't believe in Jesus. It's not on the menu for us. It's not an option. And so their goal was to make sure that every Jew, you know, within earshot would know there is such an organization called Jews for Jesus because they wanted Jewish people to know there are Jews who believe in Jesus and it's, it's on the menu. Um, so initially, our work was directed explicitly and exclusively and directly to counter their activities. That's what we were initially focused on. Um, the work initially was uh, educating the Jewish community, uh, raising awareness, because the Jewish community didn't really know who these people were. They didn't understand these people. You know, what is motivating them? What are their tactics? What are their strategies? You know, what, what, what is this all about? Just to understand them. Um, and it's also, you know, important in terms of um, warning people about them uh, to just get the word out. So a lot of our work initially was uh, building awareness, uh, letting the Jewish community know there was such a problem, um, why it's a problem. Many Jewish people didn't understand why it's a problem. What difference does it make if a Jew believes in Jesus? You know, they don't understand what's at stake. You know, many Jewish people don't understand what Christians actually believe about Jesus. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that I, uh, I, I, teach my, my classes is that, you know, traditional normative Christianity believes that Jesus is God. And they always scream back at me, no, they don't. They don't believe that. They just believe he's the son of God, as if son of God is not God. And I have to explain to them, no, for Christians, son of God is God, right? They believe in a three-part God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So when you let Jewish people know that this is one of the things that's at stake here, that you're not just believing that some Jewish fellow from 2,000 years ago was the Messiah. You know, when a Jew embraces this, they are worshiping him as God, and that's idolatry. And idolatry is something that most Jewish people have a real aversion to. But what's interesting, and we, we taught this, is that if you read the, the training manuals of groups like Jews for Jesus, they would train their missionaries that in the initial stages of evangelism, don't, you know, talk about this idea that Jesus is God. Just talk about him as the Messiah, because that's not so off-putting to Jewish people. So that's what our initial focus was, raising awareness, explaining to the Jewish community who these people were, um, and counseling. We were in touch with numerous families who lost children or other people in their families, sometimes adults, and uh, so those are the focus. The focus of our work was uh, education. We called it preventative education and counseling and building awareness. 
Um, but then what happened, you have to remember, this was the early 80s. And there was another phenomenon that was taking place back then, um, which we don't see so much about anymore. It hasn't disappeared, but it was quite uh, you know, prevalent back then in the, in the late 60s, 70s, and even to the 80s, which was the uh, proliferation of various cults in, uh, in the world. And unfortunately, Jewish people tended to have to be overly represented beyond our per percentage in the population in these groups. And there were all kinds of cults. There were psychotherapeutic cults and cults that were from Eastern religions and political cults. I mean, you name it. Um, and what happened was we didn't really even know about these groups. But because there wasn't anyone else in the Jewish community that was responding to a cries for help from parents who were also losing their family members to these kinds of groups, they ended up in our lap. And so we had to learn on the job. And so that became a secondary um, focus of our work after dealing with the Christian missionaries was dealing with cults. And then... Um, I would say around 19, around 1995 to 1998, approximately around that time, we sort of had another epiphany. And we realized by this time, it took us about, uh, you know, 15 years, that Jews for Jesus is not the problem. We finally realized that. They're not the problem. We came to realize that they are simply a symptom of, of the problem. And the real problem is a disconnect between Jews and Judaism. And what led us to that realization was seeing not just Jewish people getting caught up in churches and in cults, but seeing that about 25% of North American Buddhists came from a Jewish background. Um, seeing the tremendous number of Jews involved with the New Age uh, movements and New Age uh, religions, and basically seeing that the disaffection, the, 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 you know, the sort of the falling through the cracks of Jewish people was not just to uh, Christianity and cults, it was to dozens and dozens and dozens of different uh, locations on the spiritual map. And so we, we thought about this and we came to realize that it's really all the same problem. And the, the fourth issue that got sort of thrown into this mixture was uh, assimilation and intermarriage. Um, and that's what led us to sort of think about what's the, we say in, in Hebrew, tzad hashava shabahen, what is the common denominator of all of these problems uh, you know, the problems of Jews converting to Christianity or getting involved with cults or Buddhism or assimilating and intermarrying. It's basically that they're not strongly connected to their spiritual core. They're not strongly connected to Judaism. And uh, when, that, when that problem exists, that's the real problem. So the same way in medicine, you know, you can have an underlying medical issue, but it can present in different ways. It can present as a pain in your uh, stomach. The same problem in other people can present as a pain in their lower back. In some people, it could be in their side. So th the underlying problem we came to realize was not Jews for Jesus. It was Jews that were disconnected from Judaism. And we sort of woke up and said, That's, that makes sense. We didn't name our organization Jews Against Jesus. We named it Jews for Judaism. And um, at that point, it sort of took us into a little bit of a different direction, meaning that um, we continued doing all of our work that we were doing, dealing with Christian missionaries and dealing with cults and dealing with you know, the challenges of Eastern religions and dealing with the challenges of Jews assimilating and intermarrying. But a, a, a bigger component of our work became trying to help Jewish people connect 
with the spiritual treasures of Judaism. Um, and so anyone now, for example, that goes to our YouTube channel will see that about half of our videos deal with the challenges of Christianity, the claims that Christian missionaries make, what is the Jewish response to Christianity, how do we understand questions like who the Messiah is, and how do you get forgiven for your sins. Um, but about half of our videos deal with Jewish spiritual uh, issues, everything from, you know, yoga to meditation to, you know, life after death. I mean, we have, you know, hundreds of videos. And what we have found is that for many Jewish people worldwide, um, this has become their, thank God, their uh, entry point back into Judaism. Um, so I would say that's pretty much uh, our work at this point. Now, there are a few um, second, I say, sort of related issues. Um, and I'll just stop there because I don't want to spend the whole time answering that one question. But the, the sort of the related issues are um, that because we've spent so much time studying these areas, so we become sort of consultants to Jewish communities uh, throughout the world when it comes to their communal responses to these problems. So just as an example, you know, there's a massive movement today in the world of Christian Zionists. These are evangelical Christians who are uh, very deeply supportive of Israel. Um, and, you know, we are always asked this question, you know, are these people, is this group that wants to do a program at our synagogue, they want to partner with us, they want to go to Israel with us, what have you, are they okay? And so we will do a lot of that kind of, um, uh, you know, sort of investigating, if I can use that word, to help Jewish communities understand who we're dealing with. Um, and it's very interesting. I'll just mention one fascinating story. Um, I had written a column in, I think it was the Jewish press before I moved to Toronto. And um, I exposed a Christian missionary um, that was really a stealth missionary. Many Jewish people had no idea this person had any kind of agenda to convert Jews. Everyone thought he was, you know, the greatest thing in the world, very, you know, loving Israel, loving the Jews. And um, when I came here, I got a phone call from a reporter uh, for, from a newspaper in New Jersey who said that um, they had read my articles and they remember that I mentioned an organization called um, Friends of Israel Gospel Ministries. Um, it wasn't the name of the group that I had been writing about. I just mentioned them in passing. And he said that in his town in New Jersey, the Jewish Federation um, is every year going on trips to Israel with a group called Friends of Israel. And he wanted to know if this group is okay, Friends of Israel. So I sent him a package, a whole package, um, you know, because I, I get their magazines and I have, I have done a tremendous amount of research about this group. I told him, look, Friends of Israel is not their real name. The real name is Friends of Israel Gospel Ministries. And, uh, you know, they are dedicated aggressively to trying to convert Jews. They have a... Uh, you know, a whole institute where they train missionaries and they do missionary work in Israel itself. And he wrote an article about it. And the president of the Federation went ballistic. He was very upset. And he said, I've been to Israel with these people many times. They never tried to convert me. And I, I had to speak to this president of the Federation and explain, in your mind, what does it mean that someone's going to try to convert you? Does it mean that they have to whip out a New Testament and get you to read passages from Matthew? I said, that's not how they operate. And that, again, that's part of what we do is to explain to the Jewish community how missionaries operate. Uh, missionaries have something that they call lifestyle evangelism or friendship evangelism. And they realize that if they're going to take out the New Testament and have Jewish people read it, it's going to be a turnoff. So they believe that the most effective thing they can do 
in order to get Jewish people to be more interested in their faith is simply to be loving and to be supportive and to be nice and to be friendly. And so this unfortunately naive person assumed that this organization, Friends of Israel, was totally par of because in his mind, they never tried to convert him, but they didn't realize that every single thing they were doing, everything they were doing was for the ultimate purpose of getting him and his group uh, to ultimately, uh, you know, think more positively about uh, Christianity. Um, so that's one thing that we do is we're basically a community liaison. We uh, help provide information for Jewish leaders, uh, teachers, um, you know, teachers that are teaching this subject matter will call us for recommendations for curriculum. We often go into schools to teach. Um, and then just I'll mention one more thing, um, and then I'll stop, <laughs> um, which, is, which is something that has been totally unexpected. I would say of all the things that we do that we did not plan for, did not think about, did not expect, uh, did not anticipate. Um, it took place when we started uh, our YouTube channel. Um, prior to the YouTube channel, 100% of our interaction with people was with the Jewish community. We would speak at synagogues. We would teach classes at uh, Jewish organizations. We would publish material that went into the hands of Jewish people. But as soon as we started a YouTube channel, we didn't really anticipate this, but it's sort of a no-brainer. About 90% at least of the people that are going to be watching our YouTube videos are not Jewish. And so one of the things that's happened over the years is um, there's been an impact on the Christian world as a result of the kind of work that we've been doing, meaning that for the first time now, Christians who have never been exposed to Judaism or any Jewish ideas, the only thing that they know about Judaism is what they learn in their churches. And now you have hundreds of thousands, millions actually. I mean, I don't remember the last number of our video views. I think it was like five or six million. Um, a lot of Christians are hearing, you know, a rabbi talk for the first time in their life. And they're hearing from the horse's mouth why we don't believe in Christianity. And so one of the things that's happened over the years is that I would say maybe seven or eight, nine, ten years ago, I would get one phone call or one email every few months from a Christian who said, you know, Rabbi, I think you guys are right. What do I do now? Um, now it's about one or two a day. So this is uh, something that was, I would say, collateral damage in a sense. We didn't expect to be dealing with so many people that are coming from a non-Jewish background that are questioning their faith now. In regard to Christianity, right, there's, you know, sort of mainstream Christianity. Um, and would you say that mainstream Christianity buys into the things that, that the Jews for um, Jesus and these types of organizations say, or, or, or are they, you know, openly different uh, and openly perhaps against what they're doing? So it's a good question because, you know, as Jews, we're, we're used to the idea that the Jewish community is not monolithic. You know, most Jews are aware that, you know, you have uh, different denominations in the Jewish community and different groups, and we're not all exactly the same. Um, but we tend to think that the, everyone else, everyone that's Christian is just Christian. And we don't appreciate the fact that they are incredibly diverse. Um, there are about 2.2 billion Christians in the world. You know, when you think about 2.2 billion Christians, the point two part of that is 200 million, <laughs> and we're about 15, 16 million. Um, there are, according to some estimates, about 30,000 Christian denominations. Um, you know, we've all heard of Baptists, for example, but there are about 300 kinds of Baptists. So <laughs> you're talking about a very, very, very diverse world. And if, you know, people have studied history, they know that Christians in the past went to war and killed each other over their theological differences. You know, for, for many Christians, religion was a contact sport. So um, 
the truth is that um, what I've been describing is not uh, uh, universally uh, supported in the Christian world. Um, to make our lives easier, um, you know, you basically have, f for the most part, um, several major groups, let's say, within Christianity. You have the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Christian churches, like the Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. So let's say they're about a half of the Christian world right there. Ca the Roman Catholic Church is almost a billion people. Um, and let's say everyone else more or less is Protestant. That's where you have all these different denominations. Now, among Protestants, you have two major, let's say you could divide them into two major groups. You have what we would call liberal Protestants, like, for example, the United Church of Canada is a liberal Protestant group. Um, I'll just tell a very wild story just for a second while I'm on this. Um, years ago, um, some of you might remember that uh, there was a funeral that was interrupted. There was a, one of the leading uh, Jews for Jesus missionaries passed away and was supposed to be buried in a Jewish cemetery here in Toronto. And uh, basically the, the funeral was, 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 was uh, called off. I mean, they had to bury him in a non-denominational cemetery. Um, but prior to his passing away, I was on a television program with him in Toronto. Um, we were interviewed, I forget the name of the program, but it was a, a religious show and there were two parts to the program. The first segment, the first 15 minutes, was the new, um, I forget what he's called now, the offices, um, but there's the head of the United Church. Um, there's a title that they have. And there was a new one. He came from Calgary. His name was Bill Phipps, I think, or William Phipps, Philip Phipps. And it was fascinating interview to hear because this fellow, who was the head of the United Church, did not believe in the virgin birth, did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus, did not believe that you had to believe in Jesus to go to heaven, did, I mean, basically didn't believe in anything that Christianity believed in. And that, he, then he had his segment was over, and then I went on with this fellow from Jews for Jesus. And the premise of our exchange was, um, you know, he's going to be claiming that what he believes is very Jewish, and I'm going to basically be saying, no, not really, what you're believing is not really Jewish. So we're having our discussion back and forth, and the, the host of the program at one point turns to this fellow that I'm, that I'm debating incredulously and says to him, you're Jewish? She said to him, you're more Christian than the head of the United Church. <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically, um, you have a lot of what we would call liberal Protestants. Um, and they have absolutely zero um, interest in any of these things. They, they, they see the evangelical Christians, meaning the, the, what I would call the conservative Protestants, the evangelical Protestants, they see them as, as lunatics and as, uh, as people that they can't, they, they can't tolerate. They see them as close-minded, as bigoted, as uh, you know, hostile to everything that they value and believe. Um, so you don't have this Jews for Jesus kind of proselytizing supported by liberal Protestants, and it's not really supported by the Catholic Church either. So we're talking about, um, the, the, let's say, the flavor of Christians that back this kind of evangelism. We usually refer to them as the evangelical Protestant movement, um, which is quite large. I mean, the, as we know, in the United States, for example, there, they number about 25 to 40 percent of Americans identify as evangelical. We know that in the United States, they are a serious voting bloc. Um, in Canada, it's only about 10 percent. Only about 10 percent of Canadians identify as evangelical. But it's still, it's a serious number of people worldwide. And so um, to answer your question, you know, not all Christians are in support of this kind of uh, evangelism, but a serious number are. And the more important thing to be aware of is not just the numbers. You know, they always talk about when you're driving a car, 
There's the speed of the car and there's the acceleration. And what's important to understand about these particular Christians that are obsessed with converting Jews, by the way, not just converting Jews, they want to convert the whole world, but Jews are a special target to them. You know, they have a special affinity in their heart to convert Jews. Um, what's different about these Christians as opposed to others is the degree of their passion and faith. These are people that are 1,000 degree, 1,000 percent sold on their faith. Um, you know, they say that the best salesperson is someone who really believes in their product. It could be a lousy product, but if the salesperson believes in the product a thousand percent, they're going to be successful at selling it. And so the, the thing to remember about these evangelical Protestants is that they are um, very, very, very uh, gung-ho and sincere about their faith. I see. So, so now, when uh, uh, you, know, you mentioned that one of the biggest issues is really Jewish ignorance, um, that Jews don't know what they really believe, and, and then you know, they'll, they'll come across these people and, and be enticed. Um, but, you know, it's, um, it just seems to be funny because here, if you have a Jew who doesn't just seem, you know, is a pretty secular, doesn't seem to be overly interested in religion, um, you know, is walking down the street and comes across somebody with a t-shirt that says Jews for Jesus, and they give them a pamphlet with some picture of some rabbi on it. Um, I don't see what they're going to do to them. How's that going to affect somebody? Like it's, what what is the real draw that gets somebody to go from being a Jew walking down the street whose whose Jewish experiences are are primarily gastronomic to somebody who gets snared in by this? So this is a very important question, and um, it's very it is it's important to understand their modus operandi, because you're right. Um, when people go out on the street with T-shirts handing out Jews for Jesus literature, they know. They're, they're not unaware of the fact that this is, you know, the, the, not the most effective way of reaching people. You know, in sales, for example, it would be the equivalent of cold calling, right? The, the worst kind of sales to do is cold calling. Um, so why do they do it? Why, why are they out on the street with, with their, you know, goofy pamphlets and their T-shirts? So for a few reasons. I mentioned before that they are very, very invested in making sure that they have product recognition. They want every Jew to be aware that there is such a thing as Jews who believe in Jesus so that it's not off the menu. It's not absurd. And so that's one reason why they're out there. They want to keep their, you know, their, their presence in our consciousness. Another reason is, we often don't think about this, there's a lot of competition among groups that are trying to convert Jews. Jews for Jesus, you know, we use the, the we use that term generically to refer to any such group, but there are hundreds and hundreds of different organizations that are trying to convert Jews. Don't we feel special? There are so many organizations that are trying to convert us. Literally, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds, and they compete for dollars. They compete for support. And so one of the things that Jews for Jesus does, they know that, you know, people are busy, people are not interested, people, the last thing that a Jew wants to do is talk to some Jews for Jesus, Meshuggah on the street. But who does go up to them on the street and say, Shkayach, you're doing a great job. We love what you're doing, right? Christians that believe that it's important to convert Jews. And these Christians that they meet on the street will be happy to get their their contact information, to receive their newsletter, and to become a supporter. So they have their reasons for um, why they're out on the street. Now, in terms of how is it that they're able to ultimately reach Jewish people, so I'll share with you a secret. They spend very f little time on the street handing out literature. They don't do this a lot because, again, they know that this is not the most effective way of reaching Jews. But one of the things, if you wanted to follow a Jews for Jesus staff person and see what they do all day long, they do a tremendous amount of programming in churches. 
They give lectures in churches. They have, you know, programs like, for example, the Messiah and the Passover, where they try to show that the Passover Seder, you know, was the Last Supper. And they have, you know, they, they have a whole bunch of different programs they do in churches. Now, you could ask, why in the world are they going to waste their time going to churches? How many Jews are going to be in those churches? Zero. But what they're doing when they go to these churches is, number one, encouraging um, evangelical lay people, meaning balabatim, the, the, the regular churchgoers, encouraging them to try to influence their Jewish friends and neighbors and business associates. Now, Jews for Jesus did a study. They actually did a, a survey many years ago of 8,000 Jews who converted to Christianity. And they asked them, what, what was it that led you to Jesus? And as you can imagine, almost no one said, well, because someone gave me this fascinating pamphlet on the street. But virtually everyone said it was through the influence of a Christian friend, neighbor, or business associate. These are the people that are going to be effective. And you have to realize that the missionary on the street has several strikes against him. Number one, it's, he has no relationship with this Jewish person. He's annoying, right? It's an, it's an annoying thing to be trying to go somewhere in downtown Toronto and some guy stops you on the street and trying to give you a pamphlet. Um, it's like cold calling. Again, there's no real relationship. Number two, the Jew... Jewish person is usually offended by these people. They, they, we see them as traitors or as annoying, but it's, there's not a lot of rapport. Um, but the, the evangelical Christian who goes to church and has a Jewish friend or Jewish neighbor or Jewish business associate, so there it's not cold calling. There there's a real relationship. This is the kind of person that may come to borrow some sugar from you. They may want to borrow your lawnmower. They may, you know, whatever neighbors do, whatever co-workers do, whatever friends do. could be even a relative. So they don't have that problem of, um, you know, of cold calling because there's a relationship already. And, and you don't have the problem of uh, seeing a Jewish person that's trying to influence you, and we're bothered by that. This is a non-Jew. This is a Christian. They're supposed to believe in Jesus. So we don't have the negative reaction, you know, to our Christian friends, neighbors, and business associates. So what Jews for Jesus does, and not just them, the other groups as well, they do a lot of programming in churches to encourage these Christians to try to share their faith with their Jewish friends and neighbors. Because you have to appreciate... Your typical Christian layperson is very intimidated by Jews. They think Jews are all Old Testament Bible scholars. It's like when I was growing up, you thought that any kid from Japan must have been a karate expert. So a lot of Christians, they say to themselves, I can't talk to my Jewish neighbor about, about Jesus. They know the Old Testament by heart. They're going to destroy me. So the Jews for Jesus people tell them, don't worry the average Jewish person never even read the Bible once. Um, and then th what they do is they explain th how important it is, you know, because a lot of Christian people might feel that, you know, it's not sensitive to try to convert Jews. They just went through the Holocaust, leave them alone. And the Jews for Jesus will say, are you kidding? That's the most anti-Semitic thing you can do in the world is not to tell them about Jesus. Do you want them going straight from the fires of Auschwitz to the fires of hell? Because again, the Christian evangelicals believe that unless you accept Jesus, you will burn in hell forever. So they spend a lot of time trying to encourage Christian lay people about how important it is to convert Jews and encourage them to what they use the term witness or share, share their faith. Uh, witness to their Jewish friends, neighbors, and business associates. And then they train them. What are you supposed to say to a Jew? What shouldn't you say? How do you make an inroad? How do you introduce yourself? And they have books and they have CDs and they have websites and they have training and they have pamphlets. And they train these Christians how to more effectively reach their Jewish friends and neighbors. Now, that's the first stage of what happens. The first stage is basically mobilizing this massive army 
massive army of committed, born-again, evangelical lay people to reach out to their Jewish friends and neighbors. I forgot to mention the third advantage that you have by doing this. How many people work for Jews for Jesus? They may have only five or six people working in their office. But you have, you know, I don't know how many evangelical Protestants living in Toronto, but let's say at least 100,000, probably a lot more than that. So it, it's just the most effective thing they can do is to mobilize this army of potential salespeople. And then what happens is this. They tell them, take it slow, don't rush. You may have to first ask a lot of questions about Judaism. You know, there may be a Jewish holiday coming up. Ask your Jewish friend or neighbor, oh, you're having your new year. What's Rosh Hashanah all about? And then, you know, build slowly to the point where you can maybe, after you gain their trust, start maybe talking about other spiritual things, about your prayer life. You know, the, the ones that are smart know to do it subtly and slowly. But they know, and this is the most important piece here, they know that Jewish people have a tremendous resistance to believing in Jesus. And they know that there's a lot of guilt. And so even if they're able to get their Jewish friend or neighbor to be interested in Jesus, to be interested in the gospel, to be interested in Christianity, the Jewish person they know is always going to have this objection. They might say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I really find Jesus to be compelling. And I'm, I, I think you're reasons for believing in him are compelling. But Jews don't believe in Jesus. That's the prop, That's the hang-up. But Jews don't believe in Jesus. So this is where the Christian who's been going to church and went to the seminar that Jews for Jesus ran is able to say, well, I know someone who's Jewish and believes in Jesus. Would you like to meet them? Who is that person who's Jewish and believes in Jesus. It's the Jews for Jesus staff person that came to their church and gave them their business card. So what the Jews for Jesus staff people do, they're not running around the city cold calling all day long. They know that's a poor use of their time. They are, number one, spending some of their time mobilizing an army of salespeople. But then, if you're familiar with sales... They come in at the end of the process. I should say process. I'm here in Canada now. They come in at the end when the Jewish person is biting but has the hesitation, but I'm Jewish. Jews don't believe in Jesus. And now the Christian neighbor or friend can say, well, I know someone that's Jewish and believes in Jesus. Would you like to be to introduce you to them? And then he gives them the business card or the phone number or connects them with email with the director of Jews for Jesus here. And now, what do the Jews for Jesus staff people spend their time doing in Toronto? They're closing sales. They're closers. And so they will meet with someone at a coffee shop. They'll meet with someone in their living room, at their breakfast table. And what they're doing is just getting that Jewish person who's interested and who's biting, but they're getting them over that final hump because they can say, I'm Jewish. I believe in Jesus, and this is, this is how I live my life. And that's often, for Jewish people, the last step. That's all that's needed. So the, the thing I wanted to add is that the, the conversion of Jewish people is, generally speaking, I would say, not an intellectual process. It's not that the Christian has proven to them intellectually or proven to them through the Bible that they should believe in Jesus. I would say that the two more important pieces are emotional and spiritual. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, by emotionally, what I would say is that they have been successful in fostering a, um, a culture where First of all, almost everyone that goes to their congregations is committed to reaching out. It's not the exceptional person. So they have managed, they did this successfully, they've managed to create a culture where the entire church is committed to outreach, which means that they are friendly, they're welcoming, they're accepting, they're loving. Um, 
for Jewish people who have not found that in their Jewish community, this is tantalizing. This is almost irresistible. Um, and I hear this kind of scenario literally all the time, that um, you know, a Jewish person who, for whatever reason, was not connecting, was not was lonely, um, uh, you know, was unhappy. Um, you will find that the vast majority of Jewish people that convert to Christianity or join a cult or whatever, they had some vulnerability, meaning that they had something that rendered them vulnerable to what the missionaries were offering. And usually, it is some kind of a pain, a hurt, loneliness, um, guilt, could be tremendous guilt. Um, Christianity is, you know, majors in alleviating guilt. Um, you know, that's one of the main selling points. Um, someone, let's say, might have tremendous guilt that they had an abortion uh, or that they, you know, I don't know, that they did something terrible to someone. And Christianity comes along and says that, you know, if you believe in Jesus, all your sins are forgiven and you will live in heaven forever, have eternal life. Um, so I would say that one of the things that the vast majority of converts have in common is some kind of emotional um, vulnerability. The other issue is spiritual, meaning that um, what you will generally hear, for example, um, when I speak to Jews who have converted to Christianity, you almost always hear the same story. This is how it goes. Yeah, I was Jewish. I went to Hebrew school. I had a bar bat mitzvah. We lit Hanukkah candles at home. Family had Passover seders. I went to Israel as a teenager. But I never experienced any of it in a spiritual way. I never encountered God. As a matter of fact, they'll say, you know what? No one never. No one even ever spoke about God. Um, and you'll find people who generally never had um, meaningful, satisfying spiritual experiences in the Jewish world. Um, and so those two things um, make people vulnerable because people have spiritual needs, people have emotional needs, and um, the Christians are really good. I mean, if you want to see something they do well, they know how to take advantage of these two weaknesses. And I would say that far beyond the intellectual arguments and reasons, um, I would say those things only come at the end to seal the deal. Meaning, once someone is already leaning towards Christianity and emotionally wants to accept it, they're very good at giving them the reasons why they should believe in it. And I think that unless the person is predisposed to wanting to believe in it, I don't think their arguments are usually that persuasive. But once the person is already leaning towards Christianity, they're vulnerable and they want to believe in it, I think that the missionaries are, are really quite uh, capable of making it sound reasonable and compelling. So it would sound to me that if, if we as a community want to try to safeguard um, our members, be it people who are refugees that have come over without education or even our own, you know, our own children or our own you know, neighbors, really the most effective thing for us to do besides some education is really making sure that we, we have communities, we have institutions that care about each other, that it's not institutional, it's personal, that, that you, know, you have rabbis that care about our members and members who care about each other and people who go out of their way when somebody is, is ill or, or has a death in the family. And as I mentioned to you when we were speaking earlier before this uh, interview, um, I mentioned about somebody who was a friend of my father's who had suffered a loss in his family and just sitting in an airport, somebody walked over to him and said, basically told him, you know, you look, you look lonely and sad. And they basically were able to, uh, you know, to, to really get into him and to change and change his outlook on Christianity simply or on this type of Christianity, simply because they were friendly to him, while the average Jew was not. 
And it's something that I think that our communities are lacking in and that we need to really build on is our, our ability to look at each other and to see the people in pain and see people in need and to reach out to them and to let them know we're not going to judge them and that they're welcome and that we're here to help them. And we really do care because I believe that any synagogue, any institution, that Jewish institution, any organization that you go to, the people care. They're just afraid to show it. Or, or they're not organized to show it. And it would seem that this is the number one way for us to combat the loss of Jews to other religions is to make sure that Jews feel like they're a part of the Jewish community. But would, would, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would say that and I would couple that with um, developing and fostering Jewish uh, communities, especially you know re religious communities like the schools and the synagogues that put a focus on God, put a focus on having a relationship with Hashem, um, with you know the the importance of having a personal relationship with God. You know when you speak to Christians uh, and and you speak to Jews who've embraced Christianity, and you ask them what did you find in Christianity, about a hundred percent of them will tell you, I now have a personal relationship with God. Now, it's interesting that Christianity makes that easier because, you know, they offer a God that you can see. <laughs> you, can, you know, it, it's, you can put the Christian God on your nightstand and, you know, look at the picture. Um, and, you know, th that's powerful. We shouldn't underestimate, you know, we, we think that idolatry is something that disappeared, you know, in the, in a long time ago. But the idea that, you know, Christians believe Jesus is God, and it's much easier to have a relationship with a human being. As a matter of fact, you know, they, they were very smart. They didn't just make Jesus a human being that you could see. He is the perfect human being. He's gorgeous. He's handsome. He's like, you know, an Adonis. And, uh, you know, I, I always joke that if Jesus had actually been, you know, uh, you know a, a short, fat, bald Jewish guy, there probably wouldn't be two billion Christians in the world today. But it's packaging. And here they have this, you know, ideal human being that people can fall in love with and can have fantasies about. And, um, but what happens ultimately is they believe that they are building a relationship with, with God. And so they might pray either to Jesus or they might pray to God through Jesus but the focus in the evangelical world is on faith. The focus is on a relationship with God. And uh, I would say that in addition to, those, are, I'd say the two pillars would be to cultivate communities that are caring and accepting and welcoming and communities that have a passion, that are, that are focused on um, on the spiritual side of Judaism, on you know, on prayer that is enthusiastic and passionate, um, on you know, doing mitzvot mindfully, and uh, you know, as a way of connecting to God, and I think that's important. I think that when I speak to Christians, you know, they all grew up in Jewish homes. I'm Jewish Christians, Jews that have converted. They all will tell you that they, you know, experienced Hanukkah and Passover, but they will all say that it was never spiritual. They'll say it was just tradition. It was ethnicity. It was, it was, it was their culture. It was their heritage. It was their identity. But they'll tell you that there was nothing about it that was framed in terms of getting closer to God. And I would say that those two are the most important things. And then I would say to sprinkle on top of that, it wouldn't hurt for Jewish people to know a little bit about the Tanakh and what our belief is about the Mashiach and, you know, why we don't believe in Jesus. But that you can do that, in, you know, in, in a few classes. To be able to build communities that are caring and are um, welcoming and accepting and are spiritual, that requires a lot more work. You know, the intellectual piece, I think, is actually quite easy. Um, and, and the least important uh, in, in, in the sense of, you know, keeping people safe. 
I mean, obviously, to be a Jew, it's very important, right, to, to know and to and have understanding. But I don't, I don't think it's the it's the top item in terms of what makes people vulnerable. I have not met really many Jewish people, probably none, who converted to Christianity because it was intellectually proven to them. Um, you know, it plays a very, very small uh, component. I see. So uh, it, we really have our marching orders now, it seems like, of how our communities and our individuals and our classes and, and synagogues should be. So it's something I hope everybody takes to heart and that's something that we can work on. But now that we're down to the last few minutes, I thought I'd ask if you have any project or program that you're presently working on or that is actually happening right now that, that you'd like to let everybody know about. Well, our main program right now is to get over COVID-19 <laughs> so that we can get back into the driver's seat and uh, you know do the kind of programming that we're used to doing. Um, you know, we, we are still doing, uh, you know, the counseling. I just had a long counseling session today with someone. And uh, we usually have about uh, a year's worth of YouTube videos that are in queue to be uploaded. I mean, it's quite amazing that our, our YouTube videos now, it, it used to be that I would give a lecture and maybe 30 or 40 people would come to the lecture now I give a lecture and, you know, within a few weeks, there are a few, you know, a few thousand people who've seen it. And our videos now are getting about five or about 5,000 views every day. Um, I think even more than that. Um, so that part of our work continues. And, um, you know, as a result of that way of reaching out into the community and into the world, so people contact us, you know, through email, through phone, through Facebook, whatever. We have a pretty um, active presence on social media. Um, but uh, I think that once we can get back into actually doing live programs, I mean, I, I, I don't mind Zoom, but whenever I look at a Zoom screen, it looks like uh, Hollywood Squares to me. So <laughs> it's, not, it's not the same as actually being with people and seeing them close up and in person. That's certainly true. But look, this has been an illuminating hour. I'm sure all of the people who, with me, who, who are, are sitting in with us and those who will be watching this later uh, agree with me that it, it's really been a pleasure to spend an hour with you, but also very illuminating and interesting. And, and it has really given me some food for thought. And I hope everyone else who's here um, in order to learn how we can best uh, deal with our Jewish brothers and sisters and to help keep them on the Jewish path and help keep them in a way that is beneficial for them. So on, on behalf of all of us, I would like to, to thank Rabbi Skobak for his time and his uh, creativity and his, and his knowledge. And we really appreciated the time with you very much. And My pleasure. My that pleasure. We'll continue. It's, uh, thank you very much. We hope we'll continue in the future. And I, want, and, and I will wish you and everyone with us a, a very good night. Thank you very and much. Amen. Amen. Thank you.